Transnational now. I'm based in Tangawan Leyte, um, <clears throat> but I come home uh, to the U.S. My political involvement began in the Philippines as a student at UP. Um, I was arrested during martial law, <clears throat> but I was not detained. Mm -hmm. um, and now um, I'm based in the Philippines. After Secretary Kamilanda, I stayed. And <laughs> more or less uh, permanently. So my involvements are both with political groups here and also in the Philippines. I'm in the National Council of the Party List, um, Akbayan Philippines uh, Party List. <coughs> Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Dale Borgeson. Uh, I'm Jimmy's husband. And uh, I'm, I'm originally from Minnesota also. <laughs> but uh, my involvement with the, the Philippines came because I was a conscientious objector from the U.S. Army. And then I uh, you know, went to the Philippines uh, and helped organize the GI anti-war movement and the Jane Fonda show and all that sort of thing. And then uh, our offices were all closed down and arrested and, de and you know, deported when martial law was declared. So I came back to San Francisco and then uh, we formed the NC uh, NCRCLP. And then my mentor was with Cynthia McGuire also, and Cynthia convinced me to go back to Seattle and uh, you know start the KDP chapter up there. And I said, "I'm not Filipino." She said, "That's okay. Here's your contacts." <laughs> so anyway, great to be here and see all the fans. My name is Edwin Batubaka, and I was a student activist in the Philippines, dating back to around 1976, and uh, that was the first time when student activists again dare to conduct protests after being initially silenced uh, for about three years with the declaration of martial law. So I was one of the student activists at De La Salle University, after which I joined the underground in the Philippines, 
with the National Democratic Front, New People's Army. Then I came to the U.S. and I bumped into the KDP. <laughs> and actually, the way I bumped into KDP was bars. So on my trips to the countryside, I would play this tape called Bangon Tape. And I didn't realize it was made in the U.S. <laughs> by KDP. And so I would sing it. And then suddenly somebody invited me to a party here. They, some, my brother said, oh, there's a party, a theatrical group called Singing Bayan. Okay. And then they started singing, and I started singing the, exactly the same version. version. And then Mars noticed, and uh, so I was recruited to the KDP and became active. And then right now, um, I'm also with Akbayan Party, supporting that effort. My name is Paul Weiner, and I'm here with Margie, who is Manny's niece, and I don't have a lot of Filipino uh, refugee comments that I can think of, but here for the show. <laughs> I'm there, Tobias, and I, Manny was uh, my classmate when we were in the seminary, so we grew up together, and he is also my, uh, my relative. Because uh, because uh, we are a very close uh, family in, during this time, yeah. But uh, I was not aware because I, I I was working in Manila for up to seventy seven, and I never had any idea that money was uh, working underground. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised to hear about. Uh, this, these things before to, until I saw him again when we had a reunion uh, that was about uh, five years ago yeah, in Hawaii, in Hawaii. and uh, we, we met with all our classmates during those times we were about six and we we talk, we talk about uh, what, what we did after after we left because I left when I I was I was fourth fourth year yeah. when I left, I was and I I had a, and then I went to get my engineering degree, oh. and uh, I met my wife. Yeah. <laughs> no more peace. <laughs> no more peace. <laughs> <laughs> Margie uh, Weiner, the daughter of Uncle Manny's oldest sister, Delia, um, who's in um, West Covina. And my husband, Paul, and I, I was only seven, I think, when martial law started. But I remember a time when my Lolo uh, brought me to visit Uncle Manny in uh, Camp Krame. That was my, my one of my memories. Uh, but I'm um, excited and anxious to start the book. And so I'll learn more about Uncle Manny's experiences. My turn. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Tobias, and the bigger half of the <laughs> <laughs> seminarian. I'm just, kidding. I'm just kidding. And I want to acknowledge my friend, Lynn. Uh -huh. She did recognize me because yes. of my blonde hair. Yes. <laughs> yeah, my longtime friend. Hi, hi Lynn. I wanted to come and embrace you earlier, but suspense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, Manoling is our distant cousin, according to my mom, that we are connected to the Laoses, like my husband. So he is a relative. I am a relative as well. Mm -hmm. So we are so thankful that we had the chance to attend the reunion where we met. Of course, uh, Manolin, the ex, uh, well, that one of them became a doctor and some other profession. Monsignor. And one Monsignor, yeah, who, who is still yeah. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, thank you for, uh, what do you call it, inviting including us. us, inviting us to this uh, book, book launch of uh, Apo Manolin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Lolita Quintanar, and uh, I don't know where to start because I'm a UP graduate, social work, and Puri was my classmate. 
Oh. In fact, she was my secretary at the social service society for a couple of years. And I also went to work in And um, yeah. And uh, what else? And my nieces are the Carinos in the uh, Baguio. Yes. Jessica, and uh, I don't know if you know that Jean was the one who passed yes. away. Yes. And she has a daughter, Malaya, she's a doctor now. Yeah. And she gave birth when she, they used to have kitchens in my house years ago when they were younger. And I've always been involved in something like this, but not very, very active. And uh, last night, oh, I'm with Tessie and uh, Susan with the Filipino Community Development Corporation in San Francisco now. I'll be 75 in March, but we're retired, but we're still working. And I brought in also uh, Letty and Lynn, because Letty and I are porcelistas. Oh, I'm a porcelista. You are a porcelista. <laughs> 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 and um, we are serving. We're having our retreat Ooh. this September. Yeah. And I saw her last night. We were in a meeting, and I showed uh, Susan's picture. And she said, I know Susan. I knew Susan. So um, I'm so happy to be here to meet all of you and to know more what's happening. I was also, uh, you know, martial law was declared. My children were, I don't know, 15, and there was one who was uh, uh, how many months old only, and went to Malacanang and everything. It was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And my children are now 47, 46, wow. and uh, <laughs> I really enjoy being involved in something like this. Although, you know, hindi masyado. <laughs> and I don't know if you know Quintana, the one who died, uh, a relative. I know him. And yeah. he is her. Yes. Uh, a relative. But my husband is Ray mm -hmm. And there are 13 of them. Wow. Uh, the family is the youngest of 13. He was in sociology also. And it's just so exciting to be involved with him, something like this. And I have been known Jeline. My son worked with her when uh, my son was here in the States. But they're all in the Philippines now. They like it there better than you. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Lillian Galeno, and I um, was a member of the KDP, and um, uh, did uh, anti-martial law support, also immigrant rights work. <clears throat> well, it's so nice actually to see all the faces that I haven't seen in a long time, the Maglayas particularly, yes. they were my neighbors, uh, but anyway. My name is Mars Estrada. Uh, I started, I think, activism like a lot of us back in the 70s, 1970 to be exact. And then after martial law was declared, I went underground, joined the NPA, uh, and then resurfaced after uh, you know, some still in the countryside, uh, and then went underground again, <laughs> uh, doing some propaganda work because that's what it's called. Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, I think because I was asking myself, Mami Lamos, it was a popular name at least during our time, and so I was trying to remember. Well, I remember, well, I, but anyway, him too. Huh? he was also a very active political prisoner. Yes, that's And we did not writing. Right. Yeah. Well, I encountered the name many times because we were putting out, you know, uh, coverage of the political prisoners even that, back then. Uh, I was also mm. staff of the Science of the Times oh, yes, yes. Uh, for the religious, to look close to them. Sure. That is probably before we met, because I also visit Lai Nasiana at that time. That's correct. That's, that's, that's correct, yeah. So, yeah. But, so the name actually stuck in my mind, but that was a long time ago. And I, Thank you for coming. <laughs> and uh, I came to the U.S. eventually, joined my family um, back in L.A. Uh, and um, uh, that's how I join KDP. And that's how Annie and the two Annies here, we were all in the ceiling Bayan. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, 
and selling also the KBP newspaper and Katipunan. Uh, Everybody's asking, saying they belong to KDP. Can somebody tell us? What, <laughs> <laughs> what, is, yeah. what is the KDP? Yeah. I was about to say that. It stands for Katipunan, the Democratic Filipino. What was the K? Katipunan, the Democratic Filipino. The translation is Union of Democratic Filipino. Yeah. Ah. It was a group of formerly young men. Uh, <laughs> millennials back in the 1970s, Filipino Americans and Filipino immigrants who came together because they were concerned about what was happening with the dictatorship in the Philippines. Plus, many of them also grew up here and were involved with the civil rights and anti war movement. And so it became a act, national activist organization. More, more here in the States or more yes. in the Philippines? More in the States. 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 But uh, my one sentence for KBP was it was the strongest, most organized Filipino organization in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> we, could, we could launch a, a, a campaign, demonstration in all the cities, major cities of the U.S. in just one day like that. Without the internet? This was, this, was, this was before the internet. Yeah. No fax so yeah. not, not any organization could do wow. that. Not any organization. Wow. So most of the you know, demonstrations that had appeared in the newspapers back home, those were KDP organized. Of course, we were you know, coordinating with other organizations like FFP and, and the other anti martial law. In the organizations, but at the core of the organizing was KB. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, just to underscore that, that, you know, that actually mm -hmm. we don't value much anymore, actually, that part of uh, the contribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, that was our help from, the, from this side of the of the world mm -hmm. in support of the Philippine mm -hmm. struggle. That's still an active organization? Or no. No, no, it's. Uh, we're pretty much we're, we're retired. retired. We're retired. Yes, I am retired too. <laughs> but earlier this year we actually published a book of the memoirs of forty six uh, you know uh, former KDP activists called The Time to Rise. Oh, okay. And uh, so, who is so in the book is a good story. From here, from people that are who is in the, who's actually in the book? Who wrote, who wrote, who wrote something? Yeah, from the folks that are here. Wow. Wow. And I just want to announce this guy. We had they had to open up a chapter in Seattle, <laughs> and they had to send Dale to organize the Filipinos. <laughs> I'm Swedish. <laughs> I, said, I told Cynthia, Cynthia, I'm Swedish. She said that doesn't matter. <laughs> By the way, I have a question. Where is Melinda Palas? She's still around. She's around. She's around. She's around. Yeah. 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 We invited her to this one, but she didn't make it. She's in Berkeley. How about the Bruce? Yeah. He's, He's in Oakland. Oh, He's in Oakland. Oh, okay, don't bring me. 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 Yolanda, they uh, they made a project of making those little tiny bracelets, mm -hmm. sold it for ten bucks, and, and uh, they made one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Wow. And they sent it there. Wow. Wow. The wow. whole thing to the Philippines. Wow. 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 Yes. 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 And there's a school. Oh, and there's a school going the yeah. site. It goes Hidea School. There's a school. Yeah. Google it and. Um, it's just a beautiful place. Yeah. In my town. Yeah. In my town. Wow. In Maribi. Barangay Maribi. Um, one of the one of the school buildings um, which was called the Millennial <laughs> uh, School. And then another building which was called the Marcos building. <coughs> they were the only ones in that campus that were totally destroyed. And you saw the extent of the corruption and the way it was built. And so the money raised by Malaya and Tala helped build a model school which is resilient to 350 kilometers per hour winds and teachers also including environmental students, which my daughter Isabella Borgison was the project manager for the implementation of the 
going to go out of our script. Wow. Let's start. There's yeah. still a few more introductions that we want to make sure people get a chance, and then we want to turn it over to Nancy. Okay. We have David. Uh, I'm David. Uh, I got introduced to anti-martial law work by Roman Mana and the people I worked with at National Semiconductor down in the day. And um, I used to go caroling with Edwin. Makes <laughs> <laughs> money. Uh, I got fired from my job in a KMD t-shirt. <laughs> um, met Lillian and we got married and the rest is history. <laughs>
the mission to the Philippines to give honor to the KDP. So we came here 1986, 87, and uh, of course we came from that segment of Philippine Revolution who were fighting against martial law and as the NDF, NPA. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that's the main content of this book. So when we were in Chicago, of course, we were <coughs> like everyone here, we were working for the Philippine government, we were working for different agencies, we were working for the school, we established, I started on your school, like every one of us here. But we never forget what we started in the Philippines. So we were part of APC, Alliance for Philippine Concerns. And then we started a cultural group called, called Serka Pinti. And we were able to perform three plays. One about Carlos Bulusan. Mm -hmm. right. And then the other one is about Maki Indulag, the one of the heroes in the book. In 2001, we decided to go back <coughs> to the Philippines for an early retirement. And um, when we went back, it's different. It's like everyone here, we're retired. <laughs> so that's the time that Manny Lajos started to write the second part of the book. And that he will, he will tell you how he did it, how he started writing this book. And of course, uh, it's a different part now. We're 72, 75. We cannot join the parliament of the streets. We cannot go to the interior villages of the MPA. So I think our contribution this time is the book. Thank you. And now Angela will read to you something about the author. Mm. Um, so I'm Angela, I'm the daughter of Manny and Angelita, or Puri, or Lisa, <laughs> or Angie, or, um, so, okay, so this is like about, um, of my dad on the, on the last page of the book, um, so Manny, Manuel, my, Manny Lajos comes from a line of revolutionaries who fought during the Philippine-American War in Illinois. Although he comes from a privileged family, he lives a simple life and enjoys farming. Lajos entered the Immaculate Conception Minor Seminary in 1954, and in 1967 he was ordained as priest. In 1969, the Bishop, bishop of Abra appointed him as a parish priest of Peña Rubia, a small town in the Diocese of Abra. Because of his involvement in helping the poor farmers of the community, <coughs> He was included in the watch list for suspicion of the subversive activities. Lajos had no re choice but to leave the church and his sacramental duties. He continued his work to fight for the cause of justice and human rights outside his diocese. And he got involved with many activists and groups espousing the same cause. During the height of martial law, Lajos was imprisoned in 1974. Like other political detainees, he also experienced hardship in jail, which tested his faith and strength. Upon his release, Lajos continued his advocacy. Although happily retired at present, Lajos remains active with his human rights advocacy. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today, this afternoon, for this book launch. <clears throat> it has been one happy and adventure for us <clears throat> coming to the U.S. to go around with the book, visit five, six cities in the process. <clears throat> not being able to abandon our jet lag from the <laughs> west going to the east, from the east going to the west. Mm -hmm. But everything is part of uh, promoting this book and at the same time, this book tour in the US is one 
time or many occasions for reunions like this. Meeting comrades from the past like you. We're back in Minnesota where <coughs> Gila's parents are residing right now. On to Chicago, we have a lot of friends there because we have stayed there for the last 15 years. And then on to New York for more people and activists that I haven't seen for a long time. Now anyway, <clears throat> I have to tell you how this book came about because that is a very, that is one of the questions that have been raised most of the time when I do this book launch. How did you start writing the book and what motivated you to write the book? So these are, these were the questions. So I'm just jumping the gun instead of waiting for you to ask me the question. <laughs> I will just tell the story. <clears throat> I was telling my friend and classmate over there Deo Tobias, <clears throat> how I started writing the book. <clears throat> In the Philippines, during martial law, <clears throat> a lot of us had the experience of being arrested, detained, tortured, and even killed. Prime example is my <clears throat> friend, the principal of the school that I was directing, Sanjago, he is a deacon, Sanjago Arce. He, had, he suffered all these things that I mentioned. Arrest, detention, torture. In the end, one of those torturers, soldiers, reported to the commander, Sir, so ang banat natin. They over-tortured him. So what are we going to do? <coughs> the commander said, find a way to make it appear that he was escaping. Mm. They shot him on the head. So all these things happened to one of us. In the end, <clears throat> those who survived, we came together. What are we going to do? And then <clears throat> I realized then <clears throat> that one of us should be able to tell, tell their stories. And that is one reason why the book, the idea of writing the book came about. It took a while. <clears throat> it all started when I came back, I, I came to Chicago with my wife. Angela was born here. And then I started to write. I started to write stories when I was born, <clears throat> during the war, 1942, Japanese occupation in the Philippines, bombing of the town. I started to tell about, briefly about my seminary education with my friend and classmate, they over there. From there, I came to this, <clears throat> and things started to happen quickly. I was back in Abra and I started organizing the farmers together with Father Agatep, one of the characters, one of the heroes that I've written about in the book. So I think I don't have to convince you anymore. You have to get a copy. That's <laughs> 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 one of us also. We were, we were uh, in the same seminary at that time. Yes. Mm. With Father Agatep. Yes. So anyway, <clears throat> Father Agatep comes from <clears throat> a family of peasants, from a poor family. So when he became a priest, he started to organize <clears throat> the farmers. Fighting, they should fight for the rights according to the law. Because if you remember the older people here with me, <clears throat> during those early times, there was no such thing as uh, <clears throat> The reform. The landlords and the peasants, they had to share equally yung harvest. 50-50. Eh, matitira sa mga sa magsasara. Nothing. They have spent a lot on uh, production expenses. So, 
a law was passed during the time of Yusdado Makapagal. It's called the, <clears throat> the leasehold program. The Congress adjusted the 50-50 sharing and made it 75 in favor of the farmers and 25 in favor of the landlords. Of course, the landlords did not want to accept that and they still insisted on 50-50. This is where we come in with Padre that they organized the farmers so that they can demand their rights according to the law. But this also made the farmers or the, 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 the landlords and the politicians connive with the military. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? In my case, they went to my bishop. Mm -hmm. They reported that this military commander went to the bishop and said, Bishop, do you know that one of your priests is on, is on a black list? <clears throat> Bishop was scared because he was German. He was a foreigner. So he immediately called for me in the middle of the night and I have to go because the driver will not leave without me. And so I found him in the, in the bishop's house, walking back and forth like that, not saying anything. And then finally, Bishop, why did you call me here? And finally he said, I cannot protect you. Protect me from what? I cannot protect you. The military will be running after you. So what do you want me to do? He could not give me the answer. Maybe he was embarrassed. But he could not protect me. Finally, he blurted it out. I want you to leave. I want you to leave the diocese. And in so doing, I have to leave the Ministry of the Sacraments behind because I could not do it anymore. So that happened. I left the diocese, went to Manila, but then my involvement with the poor, the deprived, and the oppressed went. I could not abandon them anymore. <clears throat> well, in Manila, I joined the Corsini. <laughs> I was the spiritual director of this group. I would join them when they would organize the people and teach them the deeper appreciation of being a Christian. But in the process, <clears throat> one day, we were giving a recollection in, <clears throat> in Christ the King, as has mm. been seminary there. And then I found out that uh, <clears throat> De La Torre, Ed De La Torre, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know him, yeah. yes, was already arrested by the military. So when I heard that, <clears throat> I decided <clears throat> I, instead of bringing my friend, a Corsinista, to his house, to her house, I told her, please let me go and visit my friends in this apartment along Roosevelt, close to Pantranco, if you are still familiar with Manila at that time, Quezon City. So I went down, I look around, and I saw, I saw one man sitting in front of a sari sari store. That is our, you know, grocery small grocery and then another one was smoking a cigarette sitting on his bicycle on the other side so I thought to myself nothing wrong here so I went went to the apartment at the last house in this uh, Esquinita I did not look back anymore but I knocked all of a sudden two guys those two guys sitting down there they were behind me but uh, draw, uh, with drone guns, one still in my rib, the other one on my you know. So what's up? I mean, I can give you my money. I need you. Oh, my wallet is, you know. You are under arrest. You have the house that you are entering is already the house that we have raided. Mm -hmm. So they got me. I was arrested. <coughs> 
and this is again the start of another round of uh, you know experiences mm. while under detention. Mm. I would then, after my short talk, which is not short anymore, <laughs> <laughs> I will ask Gayla if your sign is already. No, but I'll just call them out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So I want to continue this story briefly. That in detention, while I was arrested, we were both brought to Camp Olivas in Pampanga. And there, <clears throat> I experienced, uh, <clears throat> I met with the other uh, prisoners there, and I found, I saw them with all the marks of civil torture that uh, Gayla will have read from excerpts from the book, I will not tell you anymore. And then, but what I would like to do is to end this uh, brief narrative and then you can ask questions later about the book. So we can continue with the next part of this program, readings, excerpts from this book. And Gayla will have to assign it to you. And you may have open forum questions. And then, yes. Or I will continue uh, another portion that I need to tell about. I'm not telling stories about the book anymore because <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to be written anymore. <laughs> I already read it. Yes. See? <laughs> <laughs> Should I read the first? Yes, 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 please. So this is in chapter nine, Prison Struggles and Hunger Strike. That night, we made a decision to go on hunger strike to demand that these wounded brothers and sisters receive immediate medical attention and to end the use of torture under interrogation. After the mass, we went back to our cells. Ed and I wrote our letters from prison. Excerpts of these letters were published in Tintig in 1979, a booklet of poems and letters from Philippine prison, published by the Resource Center for Philippine Concern in Hong Kong. So this is a part of the letter. To be a Christian, one must be prepared to be misunderstood, to be, ma to be maligned, and to be branded a subversive. While working with the farmers of Abra, I found out that the moment tenants voiced out their just grievances and demands, they were often met with harassment and threats by the oppressive forces, the landlords and the military. Tenants were pressured by the landlords to withdraw from legitimate farmers' organizations. Otherwise, they were branded <coughs> as subversives. But then, as Christians, are we not supposed to be ready for these things? The meaning of Christ's words comes alive to me now when he said, for my name's sake, you will suffer persecution. You will be thrown out of the synagogues and into prison. As for my involvement in subversive activities, let me be judged by my motives and by my Christian commitment to serve people more fully rather than what other people think I am or am not. From Father Manny Lajos, Camp Olivas, December 25th, 1974. From a letter to fellow Christians. Thank you. That is one excerpt. Later on, if you want questions, we will interpret them. But let us have the other excerpts also. I wanted to ask Louise where you were. Mm -hmm. How much of it? <laughs> it's, it's just for <laughs> the This is from uh, Beautiful Bunai. I woke up at dawn as the darkness of night gradually surrendered to the breaking of the new day. The soft radiance of the rising sun provided a glow of golden light behind the clouds hanging like a curtain on the eastern horizon. This is very cool. <laughs> the quietness of the early morning hour was softly broken by the rhythmic cadence of pestle being pounded on a wooden mortar. The women were pounding unhusked rice to separate the husk from the grain. It suddenly dawned on me at that moment that this pretty little village of Bungai was offering a feast for the senses. Am I saying Bungai correctly? Bungai. 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 
I went down from the house of Ama Yago Ao, Ao to take a lazy stroll between the houses. I soon smelled the strong aroma of freshly brewed coffee. I decided to trace where it was coming from. A little distance ahead, I found two women tending a large earthen jar filled with coffee. The younger woman was carrying a baby snugly slung behind her back. The older one was adding more wood to the fire. I greeted them and complimented them that the coffee smelled so good. They nodded and smiled politely. The younger woman offered me a cup made of coconut shell that I gratefully accepted. The other woman went briefly inside her hut. She returned with a plateful of steaming sweet potato the size of a man's fist. She split it open with a knife. The inside was of a deep yellow color. She explained that this yellow camote is one of their best varieties. Look at the moist and very soft center. That is the heart of the sweet potato. Here she offered a spoon. Have a taste and tell me what you think. I scooped the choice portion and as soon as it made contact with my tongue, it started to slowly melt for it was indeed the creamiest and sweetest camote I had ever tasted. The soft and almost buttery texture of the sweet potato provided the perfect counterpoint to the robust and aroma, uh, aromatic flavor of the ar arabica? Arabica. Arabica. arabica coffee, slightly sweetened by granules of rock salt. Rock sugar. sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, sorry. Here? Okay, start with that. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm gonna get up because I'm gonna see, to see you. A confrontation like no other. <clears throat> this is from chapter 18. I'm a maki in Bula. Hodan the dance. On the appointed day after the Grand Bodong, the delegations from Manila and Baguio, together with the foreign and local journalists, proceeded to the dam site in the village of Tumyangan, where the Pasil and Chico rivers converged. When they arrived, they witnessed the NPC, National Power Corporation workers, routinely operating their bulldozers and huge earth-moving machines as they cleared the dam site area. The delegation positioned themselves at a safe distance. The delegation did not wait long before the muted sounds of the rhythmic beatings of gongs were heard. The NPC engineers ordered their workers to continue their operations. The Kalinga braids in their colorful outfits were moving closer to the dam side. The handles of their gongs were the jaw bones of their tribal enemies killed in battle. For these brave Kalinga warriors, this was another battle they had to wage to protect their land. They were warriors in battle against these giant earth-moving machines. Meanwhile, a large group of Kalinga women, fully dressed in red tapist skirts, wearing red and white striped blouses, their hairs and necks decorated with precious heirloom beads, formed four columns and started to do their bird dance to the accompaniment of the beating of the gongs. As the Kalinga women proceeded to approach the bulldozer from the north, the Igorot warriors had their gongs beaten in crescendo, defiantly encircled the engineers like hunters and trapping their prey. With engine roaring, the bulldozer operator 
continued to do his work approaching the Igorot women coming from the south side. With barely about 15 meters away, the moving giant machine and the dancing Igorot women were on collision course. The spectators started to cry in alarm. Suddenly, the Igorot women stopped, went down on their knees, ripped their blouses open and bared their breasts, with heads tilted upward to the heavens and arms outstretched as if trying to grab a piece of the sky. They cried as one in a loud voice, the Gami Daitoy Pumanaw, Pumanaw, Pumanaw Kayo. Um, this is our land, leave us alone. The operator stepped on the brakes and stopped the giant earth-moving machine with barely five meters to spare. After this nerve-wracking episode, a deep silence settled on the whole area. It was as if nobody dared to breathe. Slowly, with calmness and confidence, Amma Makliing stood up and approached the engineers and surveyors. He spoke, You ask us as if we own the land and mock us, saying, Where is your title? When we ask the meaning of your words, you answer us with taunting arrogance. Title, documents, proof of ownership, such arrogance to speak of owning the land when we instead are owned by it. How can you own that which will outlive you? Only the race owns the land because the race lives forever. Because we are willing to fight now, our children will keep this Kalinga land. And the land shall even be more sacred when nourished by our own sweat and blood. Then we who sacrifice now would make this land secure, for our spirit will stay with them and nurture the generations guarding the fields and the villages, blessing their lives till endless time. Thank you. Wow. This was the beginning of the end for Abu Maklin after he pronounced his words to defend his people and the land, the military. <clears throat> establishment decided we have to cut the head in order for the whole tree to die. He was that was his assessment of this chieftain to let the struggle against the down. And then in two weeks they raided his house, shot him with a very strong rifle. Mm -hmm. And he died on the spot. Mm -hmm. right? That's how they answered McLean's demand that they leave Kalinga. Mm -hmm. But the dams were never built. Mm -hmm. That was the victory of the people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <laughs> The last mass of Padre Agathe. One day, the NPA squad of Kaduksa paid a visit to the village of Tata Milio. Upon arrival, Nana Sayong cornered Kaduksa and requested a private conversation with him. As soon as they were out of view, she took hold of Kaduksa. Oh, thank you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Kaduksa's right hand and lifted it to her forehead. It was a universal sign of respect. She made eye contact with Kaduksa and started to speak. Excuse me. I want to let you know that Kaduksa is the nom de guerre of Father Zaharias Agathe. He is a priest, my friend. Continue, please. So Kaduksa, uh, with Kaduksa started to speak, I came from Kandon last Sunday. There I met three women from the neighboring town of Santa Lucia. I described to them how you looked, how you looked, and confirmed to me that you are the priest. They still remember your name very well. They were wondering why you did not visit them anymore. Then they heard over the radio that you were hunted by the military and kept you in detention because you were a subversive. These women told me how you organized the farmers to fight for their rights. 
Now, Apo Padi, Padre, I understand why you are here. God sent you here to help us. Only Lakai Milio and I know your real name, and we will keep it secret in order to protect you. You will be safe with us. Apo Agatep took hold of Nana Sayong's hand and bowed his head to kiss her hand as a sign of gratitude. I know that my past life had finally caught up with me, and I am grateful that it was revealed to you because you are now my friend. Now that they are properly introduced, I have a request from you, continued Nana Sayong. Apo Padi, can you say Mass for us? We live in a very remote barrio, and the priest seldom visits us. Kaduksa received the request, but kept his silence. Finally, he answered, I am not an official priest anymore. I don't have the permission of my bishop to say Mass. Padre, Nanasayo insisted, I know that you have joined the NPA, and we know that they are protecting you, but you are still a priest. And I know my catechism. A priest is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> Nana Sayong looked at him with tears welling in her eyes, waiting for the Padre to respond. Finally, she opened her handbag and brought out an elongated piece of cloth about three inches wide with tassels on both ends. It was colored red to honor the saints who died as martyrs. Finally, Kaduksa answered, Yes, I will celebrate the Holy Mass with you. I will wear this stola that you have made, and you will keep it in remembrance of me. Nana Sayong and her group set up a long table in the open field to serve as the altar. The background was a field of ripening grain. It was very appropriate because rice is the symbol of life. Then they covered the altar with a white blanket. Two fat lighted candles were placed at each end. Padre Agatep pulled out a rosary from his breast pocket and placed it in the middle of the table in front of him. Father Agatep stood in front of the altar. He reverently kissed the stola and placed it around his neck. At a signal, Nana Sayong led the worshiping community with the hymn. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice. At the end of the opening song, the Padre intoned the sign of the cross. Ipinagan ti ama ken anak ken Espiritu Santo in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The congregation answered, Amen. He greeted the community. Ti apo adakoma kadakayo. The Lord be with you. The people responded. Kastapamahmet kenta. And also with you. Then he gave his short homily. This is not an ordinary mass. This is a very special mass. You found me as I also have found you. You embraced me as a friend and brother. I have found my sanctuary in your midst. This Mass is the symbol of our unity, for we are all God's children. I invite you now to join hands with me and form a circle around the altar as a symbol of our oneness, for we are indeed brothers and sisters with God our Father. Together, let us sing the prayer our Lord himself has taught us. Now, Nana Sayong led the community in singing the Our Father in Ilocano. Amami nga adat sa di langit madayaw, sorry, madayaw komati ag ngano ngamo. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. As the community was fervently singing the Our Father, Father Agatep scanned the faces of the people and found many of them shedding tears of joy, for God had allowed this special celebration to happen under the threatening clouds of martial law that had sub subjugated the whole country with the iron fist of tyranny. After the song was over, 
Father Akatek proceeded to bless the platters of sticky rice cakes called suman and the bottles of fermented rice wine called tapuy. May <coughs> Almighty God bless these food and wine made by human hands. May they now symbolize the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he blessed the food in front of the altar with a sprinkling of holy water. <coughs> After this, Father Agatek invited the people to partake of the meal. Nana Sayo held the tray of the rice cake by her side. Tata Milio served the wine in a small cup. As the people came forward to partake of the meal, Apo Agatek embraced each one of them. As the deepening shadows of evening time started to turn the light of day into the total darkness of the night, Father Agatep and his small band of guerrilla fighters finally said their goodbyes. The people watched them walk away till the impenetrable blackness of the night swallowed them in its protective embrace. Thank you. I want to add <coughs> to this <coughs> very moving story <coughs> of a priest MPA <coughs> celebrated mass for the people. <coughs> I want to tell you that he was not the only priest or religious to join the struggle against martial law. A lot more priests and sisters and nuns joined in the struggle. And then <coughs> I want you to know that Presently, present time, three priests were already killed. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knows who did them. They only know that they were helmets, uh, <clears throat> hunger chips on their in front of them. They were riding motorcycle. People, the parishioners of these priests who were killed, and the bishops, they laid the blame on President Duterte. Not only that, <clears throat> Duterte did not stop there. Of course, he did not say that he ordered these people to but I don't know why at some point in this escalating <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> exercise between the government and the Duterte and the, and, the, and the Christians in the Philippines, <clears throat> at some point he said, your God this is stupid. Everybody was, you know. Mm. One uh, <clears throat> prominent leader of a church, Brother Eddie Villanueva, he forcefully demanded from the Duterte to apologize to God. But we never heard anything about So these are the things happening right now. So I pass forward to the, to the present of what we have heard. Father Agatev said mass to the people. So what happens now? <clears throat> the, <clears throat> what you call this survey, uh, people who conduct surveys, Social weather station. Social weather station. They conducted so they after he said what he said about God. They stupid. They came up with the result that from a high uh, <clears throat> rating of 88% satisfaction, these are the surveys coming from the people. After he said, God, your you, you God is stupid down all the way to 44 percent. 
-hmm. It went viral in the internet. And people are already starting to say, I'm not saying it, this could be the beginning of the end for this foul mouth in paper. Mm -hmm. I just want to share this story with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Open forum question. <laughs> yeah, I would entertain questions to rather continue to tell you more stories. Mm -hmm. But it's nice if you can ask questions now. So you mean <coughs> to say that there are still some subversive out there? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if that is what you mean, a lot of people are now becoming subversive. Because people are now reacting, the church is very much reacting against what this president is saying. Three priests were killed, yeah. and they cannot explain how they got killed. Yeah. Yeah. I thought they just be some drug addicts that are. No. no. Is, is he they're just blaming. People? They're just blaming this. Is he paying people to spread pro Duterte stuff on Facebook? That's what we know. That uh, <clears throat> the Duterte is funding what we call in the US and what we also call in the Philippines trolls. trolls. Yeah. Yeah. People who would do uh, anything they hear that is attacking the president, they will reply uh -oh. violently uh -oh. Oh, yeah. and in big numbers, yeah. challenging yeah. them, yeah. threatening them, you will get killed over social media and no but that does it pay them does it pay them? that is where i'm trying to tell you <clears throat> even before duterte became president bong mm -hmm. we already know that bong bong was spending a lot of money mm -hmm. and he's getting his money from the plundered loot but if you let me go, I'm always plugging my book. <laughs> Ten billion dollars. Wow. Marcos ran away, plundered the Philippine economy. And they are using this money now to, because Imelda has told his, her children, I want to go back to Malacanang. So his boy was trying his best to go back to Malacanang. And, to please her mom. I've seen, I've seen some people on Facebook saying, Vice President Bong Bong. What? Excuse me, what happened? And then I go, what happened to Lenny? He's trying his best to buy the Vice Presidency in that process that he's doing with Komelec. <coughs> we, we don't know, but who knows? Tomorrow, Komelec will be playing the winner oh, no, no. because of this protest. Mm -hmm. Money talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, yeah. we don't know, but all these things can happen in the Philippines. Yeah. And all these things, people have to respond. The church will have to move. We have to move. Yeah. If we don't move, mm -hmm. boom boom and family. I think I, I just wanted to voice an opinion. Yes. Because I think, um, <clears throat> you know, we talk about the past, uh, you know, the, the times of our heroes in this book was how many years ago? 40 years ago? Yes. So, and now we're living in, in the present. Yes. And I think one thing to note about the present is that all of the things that these heroes fought for. Uh, which is, you know, democracy, social justice are once again being being threatened. Yes. So there's a question before all of us about whether, where, what, there's a personal question that's posed to all of us about what we will do. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's a little bit of a hard question because we're here in the U.S. 
so we're a little bit farther away but <clears throat> I think uh, I was reading this book on tyranny mm -hmm. and, and it said that tyranny doesn't happen suddenly it happens slowly it happens slowly over time and the reason why I, I was also reading a book uh, called death of democracy about the Hitler yeah. and how we assume power Hitler didn't like one day suddenly got power yeah. he slowly slowly built it until it was too late <clears throat> so the task for all of us I think and it's um, it's actually sometimes we might underestimate the value of this particular task that I'm going to tell you is for all of us but it's actually very important and that task is to speak out speak out in whatever settings we are in to bring up the the opposition to, to tyranny. So over here in the US, for example, we have established uh, you know, a loose network of people who at every opportunity you know, host forums like this, where the word gets spread out, bring speakers over here. We actually even organize demonstrations in front of the Philippine consulate when President Duterte uh, brazenly removed the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court yeah. We had a demonstration when President Duterte brazenly facilitated the hero's burial for the dictator. Yeah. Uh, those things are valuable, even though you might not, you might think it has little effect. It it actually has a lot of effect. Uh, we, we cannot be silent. Uh, we cannot be silent. Uh, uh, you know, we we must speak out through demonstrations. But not only that, actually, there's a lot of ways to speak out. I have 1,100 friends in Facebook. Before, we used to have to mail letters to these people. But now, one single post, your opinion gets articulated. Uh, whenever you're in social settings, you know, it's very easy to lapse into silence, for example, in your family gatherings, when you're amongst friends. It's very easy to lapse into silence. But that's where tyranny thrives on. Tyranny thrives on silence. And so if we can, there's a role for each and every one of us. And it's not only about attending demonstration, but it's also about that. But, but outside of attending demonstrations, we have to be able to be visible. The opposition has to be visible. And that's a challenge to all of us here, is how do we articulate what's happening? How do we articulate and support the truth? There is a question from Yeah, Yeah, no, uh, it's very interesting because when I go visit my um, sister and she sees children, and then uh, I know our, um, she teaches us at the Yale, but she always said we need people from the States to come and talk about what happens in martial law. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, and then you come over here, <laughs> you know. So I, I'd like to know what it is that's happening. Cause, uh, they attend uh, a lot of demos. Uh, yes. They are uh, they the avants from uh, Ateneo writers, and they're the ones very active. But as to say, the the young people really have to know about martial law. Yes. And they said, okay, we can arrange to let people go there. Oh, yes. To talk. We have <coughs> actually before we came here for the book launch, uh, mm -hmm. cost to cost. When we go back, we will continue our book lunch and book signings in the colleges and universities in Manila. We are scheduled to visit UP, and then we go to <coughs> University of the East, and probably we will also go to Ateneo. That is part of this whole program about uh, informing our people about, that's why the title of the book is quite, quite appropriate, the tyrants and martyrs. Tyrants, that's what, uh, <coughs> what he's trying to explain. At that time, Marcos and his military minions. Today, Duterte, also with the, the, the assistance and support of the military, they are the tyrants right now. Yes. Um, that's um, the only way we can be effective here 
if people are doing something in our homeland, right? Kung wala silang ginagawa doon, then we cannot do much here. They have to do something in the Philippines. Um, I find it very hopeful that people are getting together and getting organized. It's not easy because Duterte came in what, what year? 16. Two years ago, right? So people keep on saying, like, hey, let's give him a chance, see what he's going to do. Okay. That period, I think, so, it's over. It's over. <laughs> yes. Now, what to me is significant is uh, people go, are go, coming together and they don't question who are you? Are you a subversive? Are you an NPA? Are you an NPF? Are you a they don't ask that anymore. When uh, hmm. the Supreme Court, Justice of the Supreme Court, <laughs> and we attended the movement against tyranny. And it was launched at the uh, Queso City Sports Club. And when she got inside the hall, one is from Kasapi and one is from Makabayan. Together, bringing Lenny and Sireno on the stage. To me, that is significant because people don't ask anymore. It's like, we have to do something. Let's come together. And we need that in order for us here to support the movement in the Philippines. Uh, we went to, we were invited in Baguio by some of our friends. So we attended also. So we went there. And so they're creating this uh, movement against tyranny, not only in Manila, but all over the Philippines. So I would say that um, if ever there's an NPA, there's an NDF, what is important is for people, really, <coughs> all walks of life, all over the Philippines, should come together. And only then will be here in the U.S. be able to support that movement. But um, somebody was telling me, hey, in New York, in New York, to me, New York is really something. Because the people who organize the book launch there, they don't care who will be going to the book launch. So one of the young guests, <laughs> For the first time we saw in a book launch, all of a sudden invite went up the stage and the spell of the three basic problem with the Philippines. I haven't heard this for like years. <laughs> 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 like what? When, when there's a problem about the South China Sea, you know, it's like what are you talking about? <laughs> So it's like um, but it's Chinese imperialism. No, yeah, but I think the way they were defining the imperial is quite different, right? Mm -hmm. It is so like what? Okay, all right, you're here. <laughs> Let's talk about. And then I, I receive a text from there, or, and this is from the other side, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a text. Oh, please come and attend the mass movement uh, in front of the consulate, and you will you will have a chance to talk. It's like okay. <laughs> no, I said no. We're done with that. Yes. We're not going in there. For, it's your generation now. It's your turn. So what I'm saying is, I think New York is a very good example of people who are open to each other, and really they don't care who you are. It's time for us to go and do something about this. And then, I think the idea also of um, a lot of Filipinos really don't understand their thing. And it's our duty to explain to them what's going on. The hospital, in our workplace. A lot of people would tell me like, oh, you don't want all the Filipinos in my work? They like the dirty. Well, you really have to tell them what's going on with you. <laughs> In case you didn't hear the side comment, they also like Trump. <laughs> what is the role of the media in the Philippines? I ask my press. Rappler. Yes, yes. Uh, there is one media. This is called Fox. No, <laughs> this is called uh, the Rappler, uh -huh. and they are 
They are uh, what you call that uh, only in the internet. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. They are. <coughs> they don't have um, paper. So if you want to get news, real news, Google Rappler in your computers. Rappler. Just say Rappler in the search. It will come up. And they are giving a lot of uh, good, solid information. Um, mostly what is happening with the the himself and stuff like that. Real, real news. Real news. Real news. Real news. Yeah. That's one. Uh -huh. And then the local papers in the Philippines, they're also, they're not also afraid. Okay. Why there, Philippine mm -hmm. news, stuff like that. Uh -huh. And a lot of uh, <clears throat> commentators in the radio, they also speak up. So we are not that silent. But then what we think is propping up the Duterte in a very strong way is he is cuddling the military from the beginning of his presidency. Yeah, yes. yeah. He would uh, give promises, I will give you a raise in your salary, mm -hmm. we will give this bonus and that bonus. Mm -hmm. Because he is very much aware that if the military will not support him, he can go down overnight. Yes. Mm -hmm. They will stage a coup mm -hmm. against him. Mm -hmm. So he has to do his best to remain in power by cuddling the military. Mm -hmm. That is the main support of his president. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Marcos was about to go, the military turned also against him. You know? they remember the Ram, the Ram voice. I think, and, yes. I think there's, there's a little bit of a nuance also because <coughs> we, we can say that he's coddling the military in order for them to perpetuate him in power. Yes. Actually, more sinisterly, he is coddling the military because he wants the military support when he finally decides to declare martial law. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. So I think I think right now he actually doesn't have the full support of the military yet. Oh, okay. Yes. But he's working on that. Yeah. Oh. And we we also believe that uh, <clears throat> with his uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> graceful utterance of uh, calling that stupid. He did not realize that the Philippines is 85% uh, Christian. Mm -hmm. And of course, the military people, they are also Christian, so I would believe their families would also be applying pressure on them to abandon the territory. So maybe one more question before we have food, and they'll still be here um, to speak with folks. So is there one more question or comment? <laughs> um, I, I I wanted to ask the question about how how do you size up um, the state of you know the the remembrance of Filipinos in the Philippines or understanding of the Marcos years and um, how does it impact you know. Um, our present situations, you know, like that. And what do you think are the different textures between the provinces and the cities? The big city and the little city. And how does it um, affect, you know, um, what gets projected as how vulnerable or um, to, um, or how malleable people's opinions are? about the past, you know, like that. I mean, I, I really think that um, your contribution in writing this book is very important. Um, from what we've read so far, um, I think it's very attractively written, you know, like that. Um, and um, I think it will really do a lot to preserve that memory. Um, but you know, it's not that easy. I take the perspective more about as a provinciana because that's where I live. Um, and um, and then I also go to Manila many times, almost every other month I'm in Manila. And it's really different worlds, you know, like that. And what, which ones do we take responsibility for? And <laughs> which ones do you think we have lost 
in a battle that was waged without us being ready for it. Yes, yeah, my question would be, uh, is it important in relation to the present generation to know about the past, martial law, or is there enough uh, evidence or condition to really look at their experience under Duterte and under the rights of fascism? Because I know what we're trying to do is have that connection, but sometimes you have to realize that you know, the past is not something that is relatable to the actual condition of what's happening. And because of the lack of education in the young generation where the whole curriculum, there's no mention of martial law or anything like that. So then the question is, is do we have enough, the same thing with him, with Trump, you know, do you have enough st stupidity or atrocities that you can bring forth in relation to in understanding us in, in, in a local situation. Please. Yeah. And then also the whole issue of the change in the political spectrum throughout the world right now, where you have imperialism in China, yeah. uh, you have what's going on in Nicaragua, in, uh, in Venezuela. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, whereas before, we uh, thought that um, you know the dictatorship of the proletariat was a good thing. So those changes uh, alongside the rise of fascism uh, or or nativism as it is here in in the US, uh, Brexit, um, what's going on in the rest of Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, all those issues are, are way different than it was when martial law was declared and when we came to awareness. Yeah, what you mentioned about the young, all the millennials and the young millennials downwards, not upwards. We also have found out that they don't know anything about martial law. One reason is because <clears throat> the, the martial law history is not even in textbooks. And it's quite easy to find out why. Because the Marcos family can pay a lot of money for those who are in the textbook business. Mm -hmm. And then Marco and then Bongo and then and Aimee would come up. Don't talk about the past. That is history. Look at the millennials. They don't they don't ask questions about martial <coughs> law. They claim that. So that's something that we have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. But when the Marcos family tried to, uh, yeah. attempted to have Marcos get buried in mm -hmm. the Bingan, mm -hmm. there was a very strong protest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For us to know that students from UP, Ateneo, and all those other students, they all rose up and question about that decision of Duterte to allow Marcos to get buried there. So we believe that we have to do our job too. Inform the young about the history of martial law. And there is a very strong movement now led by the Bantayo ng Mga Bayani Foundation in Quezon City where our heroes and martyrs are in swine. Those who fought against martyrs during those dark days of martial law. Their names are already uh, inscribed in these uh, marble blocks in the Bantayog ng Bayani Foundation. And now this Bantayog ng Bayani Foundation, they have initiated a very strong movement they are fielding uh, teams of uh, martial law activists like us to go to this group and explain what martial law was all about. Mm -hmm. And I think Dinta uh, can explain about that because but he's part of that movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, I agree that um, 
we really have to go back to history. But uh, I think your point and uh, your point is important because we actually don't need to dwell on the martial law issues to understand and to protest against her. Uh, we should really read the news. We should be updated on what's going on in the Philippines. And we should disseminate more information. I mean, double it, you know, on what kind of a person the there is. Um, there's this Jubilarian in an exclusive school. They have a Bible. And the moment that Duterte made a statement against God, they created a prayer group to pray for this evil man. So they called the Duterte evil. No, in other words, hindi na lang siya kurat, hindi na lang siya magkama. Evil na talaga siya. Kasi who is a, a person who will go in a, in a field na he doesn't even know? He, he creates a theology about certain events, etc. That he doesn't even understand. So, to me, that is very important. Even if it's a prayer group, even if it's passive, if a serious thing happen, you can easily ask them like, hey, you let's go pray, right? In ESA, let's go pray in ganyan. So the, I, even if as a simple thing as a prayer group in Bible or in Messenger, that you keep updated with every one of you what's going on there is something really important. As if at your point of do we need the spirits and martial law, of course. So they know what's going to happen to them to them if martial law is there. But what's going on now is enough for us to be aware. <laughs> I have to do something about. So as simple as a prayer group in the Bible to me is important where people they promise to pray together at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, to pray those people who are in Europe, in the in US, that is 24 hours praying, right? And to me, it's very easy to for them for us to invite. Let's go wherever if there's an emergency in the Philippines, right? So that's I think those simple things are important. Mm -hmm. And the rapper is important. You have to keep up with the news. Mm -hmm. What would you say about the most recent events, a big one during the state of the nation, okay. when mm, suddenly you have a convicted ex-president, and then and then now is the speaker of the house, right? And you know, while she was doing, she, while she was up there on the podium and. Know, yeah. celebrating. Uh, I think Marcos was also yeah. down there mm -hmm. uh, yeah. cheering and so this is like a part of a, of a whole new thing. So and these are, I mean we cannot ignore these things because yeah. these are remnants of the old mm -hmm. but actually they are <laughs> very much active politically and with this recent murder it's actually that you uh, yeah, to about Agreed. the priests yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Now they're extending that with actually like branding uh, ex activists yeah. as yeah. terrorists, mm -hmm. right? So now, mm -hmm. in, in a way, they're giving a go signal exactly for the same murderers trying yeah. to, to kill them, right? So, anyway, I'm just putting them there on the, because this is very recent. Uh, we are dealing with, of course, Duterte, but Duterte is a, is a shall we say, um, a political point where all of these forces from before and today are converging yeah. or making use of, okay. right? So in a way, a lot of the pardoning of all of these uh, actually criminals from mm -hmm. before and now actually coming back to power, yeah. starting from Imelda and the family, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like ghosts. Uh, so it's like, well, talk about ghosts, I mean, it's like the, 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 the return of the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, uh, what, is, what is going on now is described as brazen, naked um, perpetration of power. And people who are already in power and they were corrupt during their term are brazenly want, wanting to come back. Look at Gloria. Yes. Why does Gloria do this? Because when she was president for 10 years, 
dalawa sila ni asawa niya. They have accumulated so much money. You have to remember that this there was a deal from China about building a rail system. Yes. It was so corrupt that uh, we had to cancel the project, but they have pocketed a lot of that bribe money. That's just one. Now, how did he happen to just grab the speakership from this crony and, uh, you know, very close to the third uh, congressman from the Bow? This is what we call among those people in power, they are fighting among themselves. Yes, they are fighting among themselves. The one that displays is not pro people. This guy, what's his name? Uh, Alvarez. Yes. He's as corrupt also as those who are taking over. And, and people in the Philippines or in, 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 in media favorable to Duterte and these people. They describe them as courageous women taking over this against this corrupt uh, experience. Gloria Royo, Amy Marcos, Tara Duterte. Duterte. So, if, if I were a woman, I would not be proud of them. Okay, it is just a kind of uh, brazen ambition to push Gloria to become the speaker. And then it will go along with the plan of Duterte to declare our system into a federalism system where then Gloria can become the prime minister. Okay, they are prepared to do that. That's why he's positioning herself. Yeah, we have to eat in this month. But I we have to we just kind of <laughs> wrap up the issues that the Filipino people are facing right now. So there's the Supreme Court crisis, there's the Congress crisis, and then there's the Chi South China Sea. You cannot ignore South China Sea. I really don't know what they're doing about South China Sea. And then there's the move for federalism. So, sabay sa point na nilalaro sa mga kapatna, yung federalism, may in-house debate yan. So, I, I, I suggest strongly that you have to read the news. You, you have, since you are here, you have all the free time. So, we are all 7B, 7B2. So, we have all the time and do something about it. You have your Facebook, you have your internet. I think you can do a lot right now. So there, just for us to know the issues: Supreme Court crisis, Congress crisis, um, federalism, and the South China Sea. And human rights. And then human rights, of course, five big issues. And they're doing this simultaneously, like piano. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, after we I can start finding you books. Yes. 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 I know, we used to bump into each other in Bart. A long, long time ago. Yeah, not only that, you know, you've been in and out of the house. Uh, birthday, I know. You know. Good to see you. It's good to see you. You, you still know. look young. We, we all look young. <laughs> <laughs> We're just the people. The people are the people. I'll say what you need to do. Everything's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to shut this off. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>